My message this morning is part of a two-part series. It is entitled, Bells and Pomegranates. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and we will continue for the rest of the month. And all of the things that He does, and who He is, and how He's such a mysterious part of the Godhead. And last week, we really talked about what He does. That He is the convictor, not only of our sins, but of God's righteousness and his judgment. He is the comforter in our lives that reminds us that we are saved. The seal upon our hearts that we are children of God. That our righteousness is based upon what Christ did, not who we are. And finally, the Holy Spirit is our helper. The one who enables us to do the ministry of God here on earth. Because how many of you know we aren't called to just wait around until some future day when we get to die and go to heaven. That's not why we're saved. We're saved to be agents of heaven on earth. And the Holy Spirit's what helps us to do that. And without Him, we are nothing. We can't do a whole lot of good without Holy Spirit's help. So today I want to talk about two aspects and actually, I'm only going to be talking about one of them in today's message. Of how the Holy Spirit helps us with that. So if you will, turn with me to Exodus chapter 28. And in this chapter, Moses is describing the attire of the high priest. And what he's allowed to wear and what he's not allowed to wear while he's ministering. And what he has to wear. And in verse 33 is where we're going to start. Beneath the hem of the garment, you shall make pomegranates of blue, of purple, and of scarlet, round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them, round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate. Upon the hem of the robe, round about. So here we see these two very specific items that God has told Moses to put around the hem. And he says, make sure you alternate them, one after the other after the other. So what do these two things have to do with the Holy Spirit? And before I can really answer that, I first have to say, where is the temple of God today? Because the priests were there to minister inside the tabernacle. And after Solomon's time, inside what became the temple. So where is the temple today? Well, it's certainly not in Jerusalem. That got torn down almost 2,000 years ago. The temple of God today, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, don't you know? You are the temple of God. And it's the Spirit of God that dwells in you. You see, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in the temple. While they were in the desert and had the tabernacle, the pillar of cloud by day would emanate forth from the temple and from the Holy of Holies. By night, there would be a pillar of fire that would show that the presence of God was there. And when the presence of God began to move, Israel packed up camp and followed after. But in the New Testament... Paul is saying the Holy Spirit's not stuck in some temple or tabernacle. He's not trapped behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies, but He is in you, and you are the temple. And secondly, we have to ask, who are the priests today? Peter said this, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Church, we are the priesthood. Each and every one of us are priests, and together we form a royal priesthood, which is something they never had in the Old Testament. You see, there were the line of royals, which were from Judah, and the line of priests, which were from Levi. Because God wanted to make sure that there were no priests and kings who were the same. 
until after Christ. Because we share in His glory. Because we look through and Jesus' lineage leads back through the lines of both Judah and Levi. And we see that Jesus was a priest and a king greater than any from the lines of either Judah or Aaron. And he's calling us to be both priests and royalty, giving us authority and having us represent ourselves to God. So with those said, we get back to the original question. What do pomegranates and bells have to do with the Holy Spirit? They're symbols. Symbols are very important throughout Scripture. And we have the symbol of a pomegranate. And the first very obvious thing about a pomegranate is it is a fruit. Duh. <laughs> and fruits are symbols of life. And a pomegranate just isn't any fruit, but if you actually cut open the pomegranate, you see that it is not only a fruit, but it is the very definition of fruitfulness. Because inside the pomegranate are seeds upon seeds upon seeds upon seeds upon seeds. So it's not only supposed to be something that shows fruit, but it's something that gives off life, is what the pomegranate symbolizes. And the other thing that we begin to notice, especially if you were to get up close to me, it has quite the scent to it. And the pomegranates, how many of you know there was a time before deodorants? And people didn't bathe very often. So in order to hide all of those odors and those smells, one of the things they would hang in their households are pomegranates because the smell of that would help to cover it. In fact, they would grind up pomegranates into their perfumes and their lotions because it was such a pleasant aroma compared to all the body odor and all of the smell of everything else that you get when you live with animals and you don't have vacuums, and you don't have running water, and you don't have plumbing. So these things were supposed to give off such a pleasant aroma. So we see here that it is a fruit, that it's fruitful, and that it can be smelled, and it's enjoyable to the senses. So as we look at that, and we symbolize all of that, we look and we see that the fruit is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in us. And not just the Spirit, but His fruit in our lives. Galatians 5.22 talks of the Spirit's fruit. And it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. All of those things are what all people in the world desire in their lives. Have you ever met someone who doesn't desire joy? Who wants to be miserable? Now, there are some people who are going to try to convince you they enjoy being miserable. And how many of you know people who really want calamity? They'd much rather have peace and joy and gentleness. And as I was studying this, I ran across an interesting interpretation of this passage. And it completely blew me out of the water when I first read it. Basically, what they said is, with the Greek grammar the way it is, another way this could have been read is, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And love looks like this. Joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Instead of them being separate fruits, 
They are all a part of love. Love is meek. Love is gentle. Love is kind. And that completely blew me out of the water because I grew up thinking that these were different fruits that were given to different people. Um, in fact, I went to the Christian school when I grew up in Warren County, and every year the teachers when you were in elementary school would give you an award based on what fruit they saw in your life, uh, whether it was love, kindness, etc., etc. So I was thinking that these were all different fruits. But when you look at it and you say the fruit of the Spirit is love, everything else on that list is what love looks like in someone's life. When you love someone, you are patient with them. In fact, you could even call it suffering with them. Yes. When that child is up at 2, 3, 4, 5 in the morning, and you're up with them, and you're loving them as best as you can, that is long-suffering. Far beyond what you would give for anyone else's child. You would say, come get your kid. I can't take it anymore. But with love, you have those things. You have that peace. You have that joy when you're in love with someone. And these things tied together so much that it reminded me immediately of 1 Corinthians 13. The love chapter. Love is patient. And love is kind, verse 4. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist in its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So church, I've got to ask, how fruitful are you? Are you walking around with the pomegranates on the hems of your clothes? That your love is visible? And that those who get close to you, they can smell the aroma of it coming off of you? That love in your life, is it shining out to all those that we meet? Because love never fails. But as for prophecies, they'll pass away. For tongues, they'll cease. For knowledge, it falls away. I heard a wise man tell me, no one cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. And Paul said, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not love, I am nothing. Even if I give my body to be burned and do not have love, I am nothing. He, re he says all those things are like clanging cymbals and banging gongs. They're useless unless we love each other. Unless we love the unlovable. Is it around about us? Did you know that the sense of smell is what's mostly tied with memories? That sense of smell is more important than your sense of sight or touch or even taste when it comes to a memory. In fact, if I walk by the person with the right perfume, I feel like I'm back at my grandmother's house. If you smell that certain meal cooking you're taken back. Or if you smell something unpleasant that has a familiar memory tied to it, it will take you right back to the point where you almost feel like for a second you were there again. That's how closely tied the sense of scent is to memory. And let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, love works the same way. When we give off that aroma of love in people's lives, 
all of a sudden they'll be taken back to another time they're loved. They'll be reminded this is what love looks like. And you know all those emotions and feelings that you had when you were in that place in the first time, you'll have again and again and again when you smell that scent because it's so closely tied to your memories. And church, if we could only learn to love the way Scripture tells us to love, people would just be drawn to us. Like the smell of baking draws people in. There are a few things I can think of that smell better than freshly baked bread, except maybe cookies. And when they're cooking, you just kind of want to come into the kitchen. When mom or grandma pulls those cookies off the pan and sets them out to cool and says, don't touch them till they cool down, you're drawn in and you just want to wait for her to turn her back so you can sneak a couple. Because what's it really going to hurt? Because the smell is so good, you know the taste is going to be even better. So church, we need to have that in our lives. So how do we get this fruit? And it's plain and simple. Plants only grow under certain circumstances. And the Holy Spirit's fruit's no different. If you have a vineyard and you're growing grapes, they have to be connected to the vine. You can't take a grape branch, cut it off, and expect it to grow fruit. What it's going to do is it's going to dry out and it's going to be good for nothing except a fire. And you know, pomegranates don't grow around here. A lot of people never really have tried pomegranates simply because they're not familiar with them, because they don't come from this area. Because it needs a certain environment to grow. And church, with a lot of us, we put ourselves in poor environments for the Holy Spirit to grow. Either we're not spending enough time getting the good nutrients, we aren't in our word, we aren't fellowshipping with our brothers, we aren't out doing what God has called us to do, or we're simply taking too much trash in, whether it's through what we watch, what we listen to on the radio, or what we read, or those people that we hang out with. How many of you know there are caustic people in our lives that are absolutely toxic to our walk with God, that just drag us down, get us into bad habits before we even realize we're doing them. As the saying goes, bad company corrupts good character. So church, sometimes we need to pull some weeds. And sometimes we need to dump a heap of fertilizer in our lives and start reading the scriptures and digging into them and meeting with people who are good for us. You see, we're called a church because we're a body. And I'm jumping into next week's sermon a little, but the gifts of the Spirit that flow are said they are for the ecclesia, which means the church body. So ladies and gentlemen, you can't expect those to grow and to happen when we're all by ourselves. When we don't hang out with brothers and sisters who build us up and strengthen us and make us challenged to look more like God. Galatians 5 talks about what it looks like if we're not in the right soil. If we're in the soil that feeds our own flesh. Verse 19 says, These are the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lustfulness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and of such like. Of which I tell you before and have told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we've touched on that last, the last couple weeks. The kingdom of God is anywhere where the will of God is being done. It is within the king's domain. And his domain is where his work is being done. And all of these things, we can't expect to live in all of these works of the flesh and still have the fruit of the Spirit. Because you reap what you sow. 
And if you start sowing all of these fleshly things, you can't expect to reap spiritual benefits. Because that lust and that desire, whatever it is, whatever desires they are, if they aren't of God, when they come to term, they come as sin. And sin leads only to death. So we talk about all these nutrients. We talk about another thing that is needed for fruit is pollination. Because if flowers don't get pollinated, they don't produce fruit. And pollination requires other people. Once again, we're drawn back to that need for a church body. I feel so sorry for those Christians who say, me and God have our own thing going on. We don't need the church. I've got enough of God. He's got enough of me. Because they're missing out on so much opportunity. And to be fair, most of them aren't in church because they were hurt by people in church. Because we haven't shown this fruit. We've shown the fruits of our flesh, of anger, of pride, of cruelty, instead of love and the peace and the long-suffering that goes with it. Personalities clash, ladies and gentlemen. If you think everybody in the church is going to get along all the time, just look at your own family. There are three people in my family. And there are days I can't get along with two of them. And one doesn't even talk yet. When she learns to talk, I really don't know what I'm going to do. But guess what? With all the fighting, with all the frustration, with all the tempers that rage, we still love each other. People get offended. People feel like they're being left out. Those hard circumstances are the ones in which we learn to love. Because it's easy to love those people who love you. When you're just surrounded by adoring fans, it's really easy to love those fans. But when they start to point out your character flaws, when they start to say, hey, you know, you really are judgmental. And why do you have to correct me all the time? Is it really that important? And, you know, you really just never shut up. Can we still love? Even when people point out those character flaws, even when people don't love us first, can we be the first to love? What's so important about it? Why is this the big overwhelming fruit of the Spirit? Why is love so important? And it's because of the word. Because in the Greek, the word is agape. And before scriptures... Agape was a word, but it was so rarely used, it's hard to come across. Because agape was really reserved for that love that parents gave their children. Because it means an unconditional love. A love that is self-sacrificing, that puts others before itself. A love that is without expectation. We are to love everyone. Everyone, church as a parent loves their own child, as Christ loved us. And let me tell you something, that's not normal. It's not normal to have patience and to love and to be kind to people who are cruel and impatient and mean to you. And anybody who's worked in retail knows that people can be terrible. That, you know, it'd be great to work in retail if it wasn't for customers. Can we still love? When we do, it breaks down barriers. Because this love is so unnatural that people don't know how to react to it. I saw something, it was the trial of a man who was being accused as a serial rapist. 
And at his trial, he had been convicted, and afterwards, the families have their chance to say something. And one mother got up and said, I'm so glad they judged you, but I wish they'd have killed you, because you deserve to rot in hell. And two or three more people got up saying the exact same things. And then finally, this old man got up there, and he said, Sir... A lot of people have said some terrible things. But my God says that I am to love everyone. And that includes you. I forgive you for what you did to my little girl. And that man who had been convicted through all of the judgment and the swearing and the anger from the other people, stood there his face like flint. Didn't budge, didn't show a bit of emotion. But when that man got up there and he poured out God's love into the situation, this man just broke down and began to weep. He had to sit down in his chair and cover his face because love breaks down barriers because it is not natural. And we say, I couldn't do that. I could not love that way. If someone hurt my family, there's no way I could love them. You're right. There is no way you can do it. That's why it is the fruit of of the Holy Spirit who says, I can do it through you if you'll let me. Will you let me love through you? And if we grow and we nurture, it's going to be hard because our flesh is going to fight it as much as it can. We cannot do it without the Helper. And we cannot go to the Helper without humbling ourselves. Because so many times we put on this Christian mask that says everything is great, everything is grand. We're going to be okay, we've got this. When inside, we hurt, and we're lonely, and we feel like we've hurt each other. But our pride doesn't want to admit it because, well, they had it coming anyhow. Or it really isn't my problem. If they're offended, that's their fault. We have to be willing to admit that we are selfish. I have to be willing to admit that I am prideful and judgmental and that I need, not want, not desire, in order to survive, I need the Holy Spirit. And that is the challenge that we all face, is coming to that realization that no matter what, I need Holy Spirit's fruit in my life, or else I'll never be fruitful. Shall we pray?